this time on The Gadget Show. It's a high-speed smackdown between me and Polly as we go flat out on two mean racing machines. This is incredible! In an adrenaline fueled championship contest. Oh my god, that's scary! The gloves are off, but the leather's most definitely on. In a no-holds-barred, how fast can a vehicle powered by chainsaws actually go challenge? You ready to race, Jace? I'm ready to rumble, girl! I get physical with Olympic gold medalist Amy Williams as we choose our top five home fitness gadgets. And I investigate the best ways to protect yourself online, guarding against villains, viruses and cyber scoundrels. Hello and welcome to The Gadget Show. Yeah, and this week we've got a fantastic challenge for you, but I've got to be honest, I did find it slightly difficult this week. Why? Because it was scary? No, well, no, I mean, it was scary. It was really scary. Adrenaline-packed, yeah. action-packed, but none of those things are what I'm talking about. It, well, what are you talking about? Yeah. It was Polly's racing suit. <laughs> it was It was just so tight. <laughs> I just found it hard to Oh, poor Jason, to, to couldn't concentrate. I couldn't concentrate at all, Suze. I was only wearing what I had to wear. You were playing tactics. <laughs> All right, that's what you were trying to I'll do. You were trying what. to put me off. Let me take this link by the horns <laughs> and tell you that this week's challenge was between Jason and Pollyanna in a tight racing suit, but it was going to be tricky for both of them. Because we've attempted it before and failed. We're talking power tools. The British Power Tool Drag Racing Championships, to be precise. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, nice tactics. It all began for Polly and I slap bang in the middle of the runway outside the Fleet Air Arm Museum in Yeovilton. OK, so I'm thinking... War? Oh, thank you. Excellent. <laughs> OK, <laughs> Polly and Jason, you've been chosen to represent the gadget show in this year's Silver Lion Power Tool Drag Racing Championships. Wow! Wow! We've got four weeks to build a unique power tool driven vehicle Brilliant. before returning to this very ah, runway to race them. Connection. Where's the connection? Now get to work because not only will you be competing against each other. Oh, that's, oh, that's, a oh, shame. that's not good. But also some of the UK's top power tool racing teams. So you're telling me I've got a building challenge against you? <laughs> yes, indeedy. In Jason, I knew I had a seriously tough competitor. After all, he is the gadget show's build expert extraordinaire, having designed and built a jet-powered hoverboard. That is the way to drive! The world's fastest water-powered car. So fast! So good! His man-cat boat, plus the unforgettable Birdman flying machine. <laughs> and of course, last year, he and Otis built this. It's a chainsaw-driven go-kart, and he did amazingly well, not only reaching the final, but also coming fourth overall. Power Tool Drag Racing originated in the States 20 years ago, and this burgeoning, wacky sport has two basic classes, small unmanned, and the one we both be racing in, large piloted machines. The rules for both are simple. You can use any form of power as long as it comes from a handheld power tool. And I already knew which way to look. While doing our research last year, Otis and I were amazed at the array of power tools out there. But we made the right decision by plumping for a chainsaw. The reason for this is that electric tools don't kick out nearly as much power as petrol-driven ones. And the meaty, manly chainsaw is king of the petrol swillers, offering up to a whopping 10 horsepower. So this year, it's chainsaw or bust. Having scrutinised last year's entrance myself, I, like Jason, hadn't failed to realise that chainsaw engines are the key to success. But with precious time ticking away, the important thing now was to decide on a vehicle shape and style. And for me, inspiration came from the most ordinary of objects, a humble office trolley. Now, I know what you're thinking, this little trolley is only good for transporting cardboard boxes around warehouses, but its design has an half got me thinking. You see, it's so lightweight, low to the ground and set up on small wheels, it could just be the perfect design for speed. <sighs> All right, fire her up. Hey, how about that? Woohoo! 
Okay, so tethering a rickety old trolley to the back of a six and a half ton military vehicle like this Super Cat might not have been my cleverest idea to date. But it had ignited my desire to explore the lightweight, low profile vehicle concept further. Meanwhile, I was considering my design ideas. Now, nowhere in the footage from the previous years have I seen any kind of dragster-shaped vehicle. And it begs the question, why? I mean, the sport's called power tool drag racing. Surely I must be onto something here. To hopefully confirm my belief, I headed to the home of European drag racing, Santa Pod Raceway, where I'd secured a once-in-a-lifetime chance to experience the thrill of a high-speed drag car. This is the UK's fastest and most aerodynamically precise dual-seater dragster. I have actually really got butterflies. And as I took my seat just centimetres in front of its 1,000 horsepower 10-litre engine, nerves set in. I'm feeling um, very scared and actually very sick. But there was no going back. My driver Steve warmed up the tyres, pulled up to the lights, then hit it. We'd covered the quarter-mile drag strip in a staggering 7.98 seconds, reaching an eye-popping top speed of 167 miles an hour. If I could somehow create a mini version of this fast, powerful and super aerodynamic dragster, I'd surely be onto a winner. I've got my legs. <laughs> my legs, they've gone. Seriously. I think I'm a bit of a daredevil and I can handle anything, but... That, that scared me. That did scare me. While Polly regained her composure, I too was about to take my research to the next level. As I met up with speed-loving daredevil Joel King, a Guinness World Record holder for travelling an eye-watering 112.7 miles per hour on his jet-powered luge. I think that this kind of luge, low to the ground, low profile design can give me the edge is because you don't have to mess around with gubbins like steering and stuff. No, do you? you just point your feet where you want to go and that's it. Fantastic. Would you like to have a go? Yes. <laughs> with nervous excitement, I slipped into my leathers, donned Joel's lucky helmet and received some final pearls of wisdom. Got it. Got a nice long yellow line going down the runway yeah. here. Follow that and you'll be fine. Then our engine expert, Ali, fired up the kerosene fueled mini jet turbine and the speed soon hit me. Oh yes! This is incredible! It is not possible for a human being to be more aerodynamic than I am right now! I love this! I built up my confidence on three quarter throttle runs, reaching a top speed of 65 miles an hour. It was enough to convince me that a lightweight, low profile vehicle shape was just right for my build. But I wasn't ready to leave the runway just yet. So this is it, the big one. We're going to go as quick as we can possibly do safely, right to the top this time, yeah? This was my final run, and I wanted to push the board and myself to the limit. It's feeling a lot quicker than before. An awful lot quicker than before. I was going so fast this time, I left the crew car for dead and almost ran out of runway. It was undoubtedly my quickest run of the day, but even I was shocked by the speed. 90. 90 miles an hour! Oh, my Lord! Woo! That was just nuts! Wow, 90 miles an hour! Like, that was so close to the floor. It was I mean, incredible. if you put your foot down, you'd have just flipped off. <laughs> yeah, and the friction was so intense, it actually seared away a whole section of my boots, and they were fresh out of the packet. Incredible. Uh, yeah, it was uh, exciting. One word. Yeah. Eyeballs. Oh, <laughs> I thought your eyeballs were going to pop out of your head. It felt like they were. I, wow. I think I literally held my breath for the whole eight seconds. <laughs> but d did those experiences influence your ideas for the actual race? Big time, didn't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Oh. Two radically different ideas. Can't Fantastic. wait to see. Yeah. Welcome back. Now, I'd like to talk to you about online protection. The web is a wonderful place where you can buy almost anything you can think of, sell your stuff and chat with friends to your heart's content. 
But the downside is it's also become a hunting ground where villainous villains can wreak havoc with your life and your computer. All is not lost, though. Armed with a bit of internet savvy and common sense, I set about finding the best ways to protect yourself online. With the internet controlling our world, being safe online is almost as important as being safe in reality. A minefield of scams means you don't know who to trust. Your computer files could be wiped out by a virus. Your bank details stolen without your knowledge. The internet might seem like the best thing that's ever happened, but it could cost you everything. But don't despair, there are ways to steer clear of online bandits. Obvious things like updating your antivirus software and not replying to emails from Nigerian millionaires is sound advice. But it may not be enough to ensure you stay safe wherever and whenever you surf. Today, 60% of UK adults use the internet every day. But cybercrime is on the rise. Banking fraud alone cost £59 million last year. So, here are some rather crucial tips for online safety. First up, social networking. It's now one of the most popular uses of the internet, with over 120 million people on Twitter, 500 million on Facebook. It's a great way of keeping your pals informed about the latest developments in your life. But beware, where there are online people, there are also online criminals. It's claimed that 7% of people have had their networking accounts hacked, including Barack Obama and Britney Spears. And if a hacker gets in, they can not only access data like your email address, but by posing as you, can also try to con details and money from your friends. So beware of links or apps you're unsure of, even if they come from someone you know. Retype the home page address into your browser to make sure you're really on the official site. Also, don't put everything on public display. Think how easily your identity could be stolen if the whole world can see your address, your phone number, your place of birth, your favourite Simpsons quote. Next up, online shopping. Shopping online is brilliant. It generally costs less, it offers vastly more choice and is hugely more convenient than trawling through shops. But unlike high street stores, you can't actually see who you're buying from. If you're unfamiliar with a web shop, check out their customer reviews and make sure the company lists a valid phone number and proper postal address. When it comes to entering your card details, make sure you see a padlock like this in the address bar of the browser and that the address begins with HTTPS rather than HTTP. That way you know you're using a secure server. Next, be careful when logging in. When you're on a public computer or even one at work, never tick the box that says remember my password or stay signed in. Believe it or not, it's one of the most dangerous things you can do online. By keeping yourself logged in or by giving a website permission to remember your password, anybody else using the computer could then access your account. If it's a shopping site you've been using, it'll almost certainly have your bank details and address saved somewhere inside. That means a chancing criminal could end up with them too. And beware of public networks. They're particularly risky. Free Wi-Fi spots can be created by criminals near to hotels and other public places, allowing them to see everything you do online. Even if you do use a legitimate network, it's still possible for snoopers to pry, even if you're using a connection that's encrypted and needs a password. Your activity can still be seen by other users logged onto the same network. So how do you stay safe? Firstly, try to avoid shopping, banking and giving out personal info that could be used by a snooper. And secondly, don't just use any old free network you can find. If you're staying in a hotel, use their official one, and not an unknown free one that your computer happens to stumble across. It could have been set up by a criminal who wants to have a sniff around your computer. But if you simply have to use Wi-Fi networks you're unsure of, I've got one last piece of advice. You could install a free VPN, or virtual private network, like Anchor Free's Hotspot Shield. This will give you a new, unique IP address, and it will reroute your internet traffic through their servers, making your online presence invisible and your web browsing safer. So, that's my advice. 
But if you've got any advice of your own on how to stay safe online, or indeed any internet horror stories that you want to share, then tell us on our website at 5.tv forward slash gadget show. There you can join our online discussion and find links to our favorite free software downloads to help protect yourself. And it's live right now. Right, now time for a bit of an update. Now, you may remember a few weeks ago, we launched a campaign to get internet service providers, or ISPs, to come clean about the way they advertise the broadband speeds which you may be able to get. For instance, they may have used the phrase, get up to 8 meg, when you'd be lucky enough to get half of that. Mm. We launched the campaign to try and put an end to those adverts that use the words up to when it comes to their broadband speeds. And we're not the only ones who think you might be getting a raw deal. Communications regulator Ofcom think that some speeds claimed by some of the ISPs might be a little fanciful. So we wanted your help to get those ISPs to change their ways. Firstly, we set up a speed checker on our website so that you could accurately determine how fast your broadband is. Secondly, we asked you to take part in our online poll. And thank you because you responded in droves. An overwhelming 113,000 of you took part, and 85% of you weren't satisfied with the broadband speed your ISP was providing. Proof positive, then, that loads of you feel that your ISP isn't delivering what you thought they were promising. And it seems Ofcom agrees with you. They've released a statement with their recommendations to the Advertising Standards Authority. They say broadband speeds should only be advertised if at least some consumers are actually able to achieve the advertised speeds. And that ISPs who claim up to speeds should also include a typical speed range based on an industry-wide standard. So hopefully things will change in the future for the better. But right now, national ISP Virgin Media are paving the way by being totally open and honest about the service they provide. They've started to show typical speeds in their advertising to make it absolutely clear what speeds people can expect to get when they sign up for their broadband service. This then could be the start of something big. We'd like to thank you all for helping us to make a difference and for taking part in our online poll. And if you're still interested, our speed checker is still active on our website. Time now for another top five, and this week we're talking home fitness tech. You know, the kind of stuff that enables you to get fit in the privacy of your own home, away from those prying eyes of the men at the gym that spend far too long looking at their biceps. You know who you are. So I filled an apartment with the best home fitness gadgets I could find, and I invited the fittest person I know to help me. I gathered together a selection of what I consider to be the very best home fitness gadgets available and invited over Amy Williams, the reigning Olympic champion in the death-defying skeleton bob, to help me put them through the paces. Welcome to your workout room gadget show style. So Amy, what makes a really good exercise gadget? Yeah, I think something that you actually want to use, you know, it's not just a gimmick and, you know, something that's functional to your sport and then you'll be excited about actually working out on it every day. We quickly got to it, giving all 16 of our gadgets a thorough workout. We tested each one on their fun factor. Yeah, I think for the average person who might just sit on the sofa, it's a good way of them exercising whilst doing what they love doing, which, you know, playing the games. Ease of use. I think it's great. You're not having to stack up different weights, it's just really simple. How effective they are at helping you get fit and whether they're good enough to make you come back more than once. And it's small, compact, you can put it behind your sofa probably and tuck it in a corner. Mm. And after a few hours of serious cycling, stretching, sweating and shaking... Okay, it feels a little bit wrong. We'd come to a decision on our top five home fitness gadgets. Ugh. In at number five, it's the Yoga Pause Mini Mats. Oh, yeah, I can see they're, they're just like a, a camping mat on your wrist. These mitts and socks are designed to be a complete yoga mat, so you can fit them in your bag and carry them around with you wherever you go. Yeah, see, definitely that's not slipping or going anywhere. Good grip. Comfortable to wear. Our number four is the water rower. This gorgeous-looking machine uses 18 litres of water to simulate a real rowing experience. I like what it looks like. It's, yeah, it's beautifully styled, It would doesn't look it? really lovely in your house, you know, you could display it to everyone. But does it give you a good workout? I think that the harder you pull, it does get harder, the yeah. resistance. So I think for someone that doesn't exercise 
a great deal. It's a great piece of equipment. I think it's really lovely. At number three, it's the Fitness Builder app. You basically can choose what part of your body you want to exercise. Okay. So you input that and it gives you a list of exercises that you can do and then it'll give you a video showing you how to do it. There are 264 workouts and over 2,000 pictures available in the basic package to teach you how to do the exercises properly. Oh, I think um, the application's really good because if you're not very good at thinking up exercises... We end up doing the same exercises over and over. Over and over, every day. It's, it's really good to keep it all mixed up and something different every day. At number two, it's the York Dial Tech Dumbbells. With a simple twist of this dial, you can change the weight on these dumbbells, saving you all the fuss of attaching and removing weights whenever you want to alter your workout. OK, so it just latches on to the weights that you want. Exactly. It's just such simple technology. They're quite sturdy, aren't they? They feel quite safe. Oh, I think it's really versatile for, you know, you could share it with your partner and both get a good workout. <laughs> And at number one is the TRX Bands. These industrial strength nylon bands secure to anything sturdy and use your own body weight as resistance. I settled down to let Amy try them out. You could have a full body workout in your own bedroom. Yeah, I think you don't need any other big machines. This has got everything. Whoa, is that good for your core? Core, arms, legs. Everything. I guess you could do press-ups. Yeah, that's definitely a harder way to do a press-up. I mean, that's a great exercise. Oh, I'm loving that one. <laughs> Whoa! It's fantastic! Stop Whoa! it! <laughs> what a great workout! James, I don't think you're quite getting the hang of it. I like you've got the proper moves and stuff, look. No, like that. it's not 80s dancing. <laughs> look, I think you need to sit down and read the instructions because a normal person, like you or I, could get a full body workout okay. from that piece of kit. It's amazing. Sit down. No, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to embarrass you with that. Now, time for a very special announcement. Gadget Show Live is coming back to the NEC in Birmingham for the third year in 2011. Yes, the UK's biggest consumer electronics event is bigger than ever and will be on from the 13th to the 17th of April next year. You'll be able to get hands-on with the latest gadgets from the world's biggest tech manufacturers. Expect more exhibitors than ever before. The return of the test track and future tech zones, both bigger and better than before. An incredible new 3D experience. And an entire hall dedicated just to gaming. And there's more. The return of the Gadget Show Super Theatre. The chance to see us live strutting our stuff on the big stage and possibly even meet us in person. That's five tech pack days, five massive halls and five enormously talented presenters. Go to 5.tv slash gadget show for more info and details on how to purchase tickets. And don't hang about. Last year we sold out weeks before we'd even opened the doors. So book early to be sure of getting into what has to be the event of the year. OK, time for a short break now, but after that... The Gadget Show Power Tool Face-Off gets serious. We had some fun in Dragsters and on Jet Powered Luges, but now it's down to work. The serious work of building two of the most awesome and exotic racing gadgets you'll ever see. Watch the ads, close the curtains and prepare for war. Welcome back, and let's get straight back to the first Gadget Show challenge that pits me against Pollyanna. Yes, Jason and I each had to try and build a drag racer powered only by power tools with the intention of winning the British Power Tool Drag Racing Championship. And it's got to be the quickest research we've ever done on the Gadget Show, Absolutely. starting with Polly doing 170 miles an hour on a drag strip. <laughs> well, Jace did 90 miles an hour on what was basically a jet-powered tea tray. Yes. Yeah, Pretty much the size of it. Definitely one of the coolest things I've ever done. Anyway, we both had distinctly different ideas for how we were going to win the race. But how did we get from power tool dreams to tarmac munching reality? <coughs> Munch that tarmac girl. <laughs> if Polly and I were going to make anything as unique and fun as we'd experienced during our research... I love this! We were going to need some expert help. And this time, I'd surpassed myself. I'm here at the Royal Navy Air Station in Yeovilton to talk to some of their top engineering buds. Good morning, how may I help you? Roger that. It's Jason Bradbury from The Gadget Show, Codename Inspector Gadget. 
Waiting inside were Kate Newcomb, Steve Bomers and Dave Lindsay, a team of expert air engineers with a combined 60 years of experience that I hoped could help build my lightweight, low-profile, chainsaw-powered dream. So, so really what we're talking about is a really good power-to-weight ratio. OK, loads of power, not very much weight. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great idea. To breathe life into my crazy chainsaw-driven drag car idea, I met up with Grant and Nick Cooper from Robo Challenge, the engineering masterminds behind the gadget show's fighting robot, Satan's Mutt, and the chainsaw-powered bike that came third in last year's Power Tool racing event. So that's what I actually had a go in when I was at Santa Pod, exactly the kind of thing I had in mind. That, that won't be too much of a problem to actually construct with it, Grant, that. No, the, the frame-wise will be fairly simple. And we need to decide exactly how the engines are linked to the rear axle and then design it around those. Back at the Royal Navy, my team and I had settled on a superb design. So this has turned into this. Isn't it beautiful? It's basically the jet-powered luge, except it's engineered a little more precisely. And the jet engine is replaced by a chainsaw engine, which hopefully will be tuned up to the max. Meanwhile, the Robo Challenge boys and I had finalised our plan. So this is what we've managed to draw up. It's exactly what we had in mind. Long, sleek, very beautiful looking. And that, well, that would be little old me. High five, boys. Seriously. The race was now on for Polly and I to turn our drawings into living, breathing, competition-winning vehicles. They need to be about two foot taller. At the Royal Navy, we started by welding up the luge's extruded aluminium framework. It's like the gravity hammer in Halo 3. Then having mapped the outline of my body, which I kind of liked. Kate's very precise, but she's also quite tender. The guys cut and shaped a gorgeous lightweight aluminium body mold for me to lie in. It feels really good, it feels perfect fit. At Robo Challenge, Nick had welded an amazing steel drag core chassis from scratch. This looks exactly how I pictured it and I'd imagined. I'm getting really, really excited. This, this is the drag car. Then together we linked up a clutch and gearbox system from a 1000cc motorbike to our rear axle, which Grant had taken from a top of the range Bizcart go-kart. It's gonna look amazing. I was getting into the swing of this building lock and having attached two high grip 18 inch tyres to the rear axle and two slick go-kart wheels to the front steering rack, my drag car looked good. Great. Nick, we're halfway there. OK, what, what next? Meanwhile, my luge was nearing completion. Having attached a high traction 11 inch go-kart wheel complete with disc brake at the back and a set of two fast spinning longboard wheels at the front, I turned my attention to the power source. Ah! Ah! <laughs> We've gone for the Steel MS880, an 8.7 horsepower forestry chainsaw. But not as it comes, no siree. We've had it tuned to the max by Steel engineers to get it running at the fastest RPM possible. <laughs> and that's it. That is our engine. Little did Jason know that I'd had exactly the same thing done to my choice of chainsaw, Husqvarna's top of the range 3120 XP. But I wasn't messing about with just one chainsaw. I had four. So as you can see, we're fitting them in blocks of two, two at the bottom, two at the top. That way it distributes the weight. With the chainsaws in place, all that remained was to install a Clicktronic box, a clever system that gives signals to my cockpit's dashboard, telling me when to change gear. Back in Yeovilton, the chainsaw was on, the throttle and brake controls were fitted. And compared to what we did last year, this is quantum leaps above it. It's brilliant. And I was ready to give my luge a test run, but I had to try one thing first. One finger. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't that incredible? Out on the track, the Royal Navy's precision engineering was paying dividends. Oh, yes! This is incredible! <laughs> what we created was a lean, mean, speedy machine. It's a work of genius. I want to join the Royal Navy. And as I hit the throttle in my drag car for the first time, I was blown away by the power. Oh, my God! That's scary! I couldn't wait for race day. That felt fantastic. Whoa! Oh, oh. Can I just say, oh my word, what a pair of machines. They are so amazing, though. They are so 
different. Yeah. Completely yeah. different ends of the scale. Yeah. I cannot wait to see you on that thing. And I can't <laughs> wait to see how fast you can go in that, Polly. I just hope one of you wins. Yeah. have to wait and see. We will. But can I just ask you to compose yourself for a minute after yes. all that excitement? Welcome back, and you are just in time for the big finish of this week's show. Yes, the challenge was for Jason and me to build drag racers with power tools to race for the glory. Yes, but it wasn't just me and Polly in the power tool drag racing championship versus each other. We were also going up against some of the best power tool racers in Britain. We were indeed, and this right here was my team racer. It's a mini dragster made from sheet aluminium, and it's powered by four Husqvarna chainsaw engines. Okay, so my, my ride has only got one engine in it, but boy, is it light and hopefully super fast. Oh, so the machines were ready. Yes. Polly ready, Jason ready. Yes. All we needed now was a race. And well, hey, here it comes. After weeks of research, meticulous planning and painstaking building work, Judgment Day had finally arrived for Polly and I. We were back at the Fleet Air Arm Museum in Yeovilton to take part in the UK's number one power tool drag race. Revving up in the pits were all kinds of amazing creations, ranging from the sublime to the somewhat ridiculous. But just as I thought I'd seen it all, Polly appeared. Hang on a minute! Hello. Oh, my Lord! It's nice, isn't it? Why, are you... Yes, it is very nice! Hi. Permission to show the enemy our technology. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, Jace, I am impressed with this. Look, let me show you how light it is. You won't believe this. One finger. Okay. Wow. With the engine. OK, well, are you ready to race, Jace? I'm ready to rumble, girl! Let's go. Rah! Britain's ultimate power tool race would be decided on this 100-metre drag strip. Each of the 12 competitors would get three heat runs to post the quickest time possible. Then the four fastest machines would progress to a grand final. Serious competition. And as the heats began, we soon saw who our main competitors were. Worryingly quick. Vorch, the stripped-down cart, posted a time of 10.78 seconds. The Silver Line Trike, 10.38. And last year's champion, Hammer Time, 8.59. But then, Bolt Lightning, powered by six stonecutter engines, clocked a staggering 8.34 seconds. Same right. Well done. But next on the runway, it was me. And I was still confident that my low-weight solution would beat my higher-powered rivals. These guys are the most serious competitors I've ever been involved with in six years of the Gadget Show. Because after all, they are the Royal Navy. This was our time to shine. I clocked a great time of 8.74, putting me in third place. But I knew I could do better. There were a couple of factors. There was the fact that I, I stupidly had my visor up. I veered off to the left, and I didn't necessarily hit that green light. Apart from that, <laughs> I did a great job. But Jason would have to wait, as it was my turn. Grant gave me a final pep talk. Good luck. Okay, thanks, Grant. Fired up our chainsaws. Then it was over to me. I hammered the accelerator pedal and my drag car roared into action. It felt seriously fast as I bombed towards the finish line, but then disaster struck. As I hit a whopping 50 miles an hour at the 80 meter mark, I felt a small twitch at the front end. And in trying to compensate, I veered left, riding up onto two wheels, almost rolling it. Oh, that, that's, that's scary stuff there. Seriously scary stuff. Despite my close shave, I'd actually recorded the fourth fastest time of the day, 10.1 seconds, currently good enough to take me into the final. But we had serious issues. The slightest turn in the steering seems to be giving too much output and uh, we, we need to make some major changes. We've just got no time. So we, I don't know how we're going to get it done. While Polly's hopes were hanging by a thread, the heat rolled on and times got better. Hammer Time posted 8.40 and Bolt Lightning recorded a blistering 7.95. Then on my last run, I clocked a personal best of 8.55 to join them in the final. Yes! Come here! Oh, I love you, Navy. I love you. Meanwhile, I couldn't have felt any more different. 
I'm gutted. Really gutted. We'd done everything we could to fix the dragster's steering sensitivity problems, ready for the second run, but it wasn't enough. Time had beaten us, the heats were now over, and just to rub salt into the wound, I'd been nudged out of the top four by Vorch, thanks to its 8.8 .8 second run. Are oh, you really upset, I could see. Yeah, I wanted to kick your ass. I know, I know that. But look, there was an important thing here, OK? And that is that one of the Gadget team is in the final. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. so shame it's not both of us. It, it is, but Team Gadget, yeah? Team Gadget, yes. Team Gadget, baby. Like the other finalists, I had just one more run down the drag strip. And Vorch, powered by two stone cutter engines, kicked off proceedings, registering a respectable 8.75 second run. Hammer Time then took to the strip to post its best time of the day, 8.26 seconds. And things got worse for Jace as we both watched Bolt Lightning go sub eight seconds again, romping over the line in a rapid time of 7.97 seconds. This was it. My final shot at glory. OK, my best ever time was still half a second behind the leading racer, but by really going for it, I had my best chance of a podium finish. Come on, Jace! I dipped the throttle, bang on the green light, pulling away faster than ever. I clocked an amazing personal best time of 8.34 seconds. <laughs> well done! But sadly, it was a tenth of a second slower than hammer time, which meant I'd finished third. Third place! Third place, baby! <laughs> Woo! Oh, Yay! Wow! Podium. That is fantastic. Very, very pleased. A huge, huge thank you to the Royal Navy who did an incredible job. That's beautifully engineered, it really is, but it must have been so frustrating for you. It really was. And on the straight, it was amazing. And I was, when we got the news, absolutely devastated. Oh. But I do think if we take it back to the workshop, tweak a few things, we could see this again on another show. Polly yes. will be back. Yes. Excellent. I want like to have a go, but not now, because we <laughs> haven't got time. That's the end of this week's show. So That's we it. will see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.